Heavenly Father, you have called us away from the busy world and the distractions of our everyday lives to come into your presence and to be brought from earth to heaven through faith by your word to see you, to trust in you. Since you have come from heaven down to us, oh, then draw our hearts away from all pleasures, faith, and hollow, that we, in faith, in your Son, in your Word, and by your Spirit, might be drawn into an ever closer union and fellowship with you. And in this faith, might also grow every day in love for you and for one another as we walk the road to eternal life through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. We'll begin this morning with him 754. <laughs>
can come to Divine Service Study 2 in the Lutheran Service Book. It's also printed in your bulletin, including the music. Please arise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Continue with the intro, after which we'll speak to glory of God. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works I will meditate. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Strengthen our hearts, strengthen our faith, 
and give us courage to believe that in your love you will rescue us from all adversities. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading this morning, which will also be the basis for our sermon, is from Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll read Psalm 136 responsibly. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights. For his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day. For his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and stars to rule over the night. For his steadfast love endures forever. Our epistle reading is from Ephesians 3, verses 14 to 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power and work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel reading. Alleluia. Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. Alleluia. <laughs> sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up onto the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, 
But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. They did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. We'll sing hymn 575, which will also be the children's hymn this week. Scripture's page is written for our warning. 
The flood that God sent in Noah's day was a global catastrophe, an unbelievable upheaval. It simply boggled the mind to even try to conceive of what it must have been like to see and hear things that Noah might have seen and heard if he could see anything out of the The sky growing black with clouds, the ground tearing apart as the fountains of the deep shot skyward, the heavens raining down this pouring of wrath. People screaming in fear, animals stampeding in terror. The evidence for this is everywhere. Do you ever look at the mountains? Did you, did you know that at the tops of every mountain range in the world, they find fossils of sea creatures? You know, modern scientists, because they look at everything through the basic assumption that there is no God, that the Bible must be wrong, and that the world must be billions of years old, they assume that what happened is that the mountains just grew slowly taller, right? You, you can look at, for instance, the way the Himalayan mountains are growing, like, you know, what is it, an inch or something like that, a year? And so they assume, well, that must be the way it always was. The, the plates of the Earth's crust slowly grinding and pushing into one another are shoving these majestic peaks upwards over billions of years and a really long time ago, it was just below, beneath the surface of the ocean and that's why there's sea creatures up there. There's another explanation and one readily given in the Bible itself. Not only... The possibility of the waters of the flood, not just the possibility of the truth, but the waters of the flood covering those mountains, but also, this may be an explanation for the mountain's very existence. Because what this slow grinding of the plates of the Earth's crust can do, inch by inch over billions of years, with a little bit of force, can also happen quickly with a huge force. And when the earth split apart, as is described in the book of Genesis, so that the fountains of the deep burst forth, do you realize what that means? Uh, a few years ago, there was this news story that I saw. And the, the news article didn't say anything about Noah's flood, but I immediately thought of it. Because for a really long time, one of the things that scientists love to mock about the account of Noah's flood is the idea that there could possibly be enough water to cover the whole earth. So there's not anywhere close enough water for that. Well, here this news article says, scientists discover massive underground, heretofore unknown, underground caverns of water beneath the Earth's crust with three times as much water as is found in all of the Earth's oceans combined. All of oceans, lakes, rivers, all of it, put it all together, triple it. That's the water down there beneath us. And I immediately think, ah, fountains of the deep. Yeah. And that would mean that for that, that water to come out, it means the crust of the earth has split apart. Yeah. And that means that the plates of the earth's crust are not just slowly grinding into one another, but violently shot apart. With the effect that even the continents are ripped apart. As scientists believe happen, but they believe it very slowly. Well, if all of these things that they happen, think happen very slowly, happen very quickly, can you imagine the sorts of things that Noah might have seen? Mountains perhaps rising before his very eyes? Volcanoes erupting all around? The earth tearing apart. And it's not just the mountains either. The earth's waters reveal quite a bit about the flood. Because I've seen the Grand Canyon. I I've seen it from above. We flew over it when I was little. Like, not just like in the big plane. We took a little plane to fly over it to see it. I'd love to go hike down there sometime. Yeah. It's this deep gorge, of course, where you can walk down and see layer after layer of these different sediments in the earth. And these amazing formations. And scientists, of course, again, who are assuming that everything must be billions of years old, they see that Colorado River down there at the bottom is the culprit. A slow wearing away. Because, of course, we know that water can slowly wear away. Rock does slowly wear away. Rock. But you see, we also know 
that what water trickling over a long time can do slowly, it can also do rushing very quickly. We got examples of canyons being carved out in moments when huge amounts of water come rushing through. And of course, it's exactly what you have in the flood. Not just during the year that Noah's on the ark, but in the years afterwards when the glaciers form. Huge lakes are created and plugged up and then suddenly come rushing through a breach as if you were to break down the Hoover Dam and all the water behind it just came rushing through. We know the sorts of things that that much water can do. There are over 120 Native American tribes that all tell a story of a global flood, a man warned by God to build a boat and escape it. And not just Native Americans, the Aborigines tribes in Australia, the ancient epic of Gilgamesh in the Middle East, and literally every culture in the entire world tells eroded versions of the exact same story. And if anybody expects anybody to believe that every single culture on earth tells the same story and it's just a coincidence, they must think we're all really dumb. It's recorded all over the earth in all sorts of ways. The evidence is universal and God wanted it that way. Just as the flood itself was universal, but people refused to see it. As in the days of Noah, when people went on with life, marrying and getting in marriage, partying and eating and drinking, unconcerned with Noah's warnings until the flood came suddenly and swept them all away, so people live today. And at times, undoubtedly, we too. But you know what's interesting? It's not that people refuse to accept the idea that there could be some global catastrophe. People are, are kind of obsessed with the idea of an apocalypse, aren't they? They're always talking about it, wondering and worrying about what will bring this earth to destruction. Will it be global warming? Will it be a meteor? Will it be sun flares? Or maybe even an alien invasion? Will it be a deadly pandemic? Or a nuclear war? It's not even that hard to imagine most of these things happening. You've probably seen them in movies, read them in books. There's a countless, the day after tomorrow, the walking dead, the Martian chronicles, the sum of all fears, water world, the passage, and I can just go on and on and on. People are fascinated by the apocalypse. They're kind of obsessed with the apocalypse. And they're terrified by it. Because, of course, some of these threats appear very real. Yeah. It's frightening for people to hear scientists predict that cities like Miami and Seattle could be underwater by 2050. It's frightening to hear world leaders threaten nuclear war. And, you know, as Christians, you shouldn't care about these things. And you shouldn't be so naive as to think that none of them could happen. You've read the Bible. And you know what people are like. You know the curse that sin has brought into this world. But certainly also, Christians, you need not fear any of these things. And the flood, and the promise that God made after the flood, and attached that sign of the rainbow, it gives you the reason why. First, because it tells you about the real threat. The universal judgment that is coming again. And second, because it tells you about your hope and comfort in Jesus Christ, the universal Savior. You know, military tacticians know that one of the most important keys to victory is to get your enemy to think you're going to attack here, when you're actually going to attack here. Or to think you're going to attack tomorrow, when you're actually going to attack tonight. It's like when a basketball player pulls a sick crossover and jukes the defender out of his shoes. One of the most uh, famous and massively successful military feints, that's what it's called, a feint in history, was before the Allied invasion of Normandy in World War II. They went to great lengths to confuse the Nazis about where they were going to invade. They literally built an army of fake inflatable tanks and stationed them over in this other part of England to make them think that they were going to invade through Norway and not Normandy. They sent out great hours and hours of fake radio chat for the Germans to intercept, and it was massively successful. It was a huge part of their victory on D-Day. What does this mean for you? Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil prowls about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. See. The devil is a brilliant tactician, a liar, 
a deceiver who will do anything he can to fake you out. He wants you to be looking over here. And the real threat is over here. The real threat to each one of you, to every person in this world, is your own sin and God's judgment against sin. The devil wants you to be distracted from that. And one of the things that he can use to do that is all of these sort of like distractions about other potential apocalypses. Oh, you've got to be worried about this. Oh, you better freak out about this. So that you're not thinking about that, the true judgment. And this is one of the reasons God has in sending the flood. And not just in sending the flood, but in making the flood so universal. And in making the flood so universally obvious. And then recording it in his word to be proclaimed throughout the world. So that people would know where the real judgment is coming from. And so that they would know not to be distracted by these other things. See, first the flood teaches us not to be distracted by other potential catastrophes. Because look what God said. That there would never, he would never again cut off all flesh with the waters of the flood as he had done. But you know, it's more than that. God didn't just say, hey, I'll never again send a worldwide flood. But maybe it will be worldwide nuclear war. I didn't say that. He would do that. He, in chapter 8, he puts it this way. As long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest, summer and winter and cold and high heat and day and night shall not cease. Maybe one way to think of this is that there will never again be any sort of the disaster. You know what I mean? Like the flood. You go anywhere in the world and you say the flood, and people are probably going to know what you're talking about. You can't do that with anything else. You can't say the war in every single place of the earth and have it mean the same thing. You can't say the hurricane or the volcano or anything else like that. There's never been anything else like the flood. And God's saying there never will be again. There never will be any universal disaster that will threaten the very existence of life on earth. And think what comfort and confidence this must have given to Noah and his family. They've just been through a year of the greatest trauma this world has ever known. They have seen unspeakably and hugely terrifying things. They've seen God's judgment unleashed in all of its power. And they know why. They know how the world was filled with violence, ruined, and corrupted. And they also know that nothing has changed. Before the flood, God looked at man and he said, Every intention of his heart is only evil all the time. You know, people say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. They're giving themselves too much credit. We don't have good intentions. By nature, our sinful hearts are completely depraved in every way so that our intentions are only evil. And here's the thing. After the flood... When it's just Noah and his family, God looks down and he says again, every intention of man's heart is only evil all the time. The corruption, the sin, the violence which had led to the entire world being destroyed, everything that they were seeing happening out there, they knew was also in here. It hadn't been washed away by those waters. What a terrible preaching of the law. Think what that must have been like to sit there in that boat, to hear the rain whipping down for 40 days and 40 nights mercilessly, then for a year to see no green thing, only leagues of weary waters. And with every heave of the boat to wonder if God was going to be done with them now too. In the years afterwards, what must it have felt like every time they saw the sky grow black with clouds and every time they heard the rain? And what must they have felt every time they sinned? Did they wonder, is God now going to strike us dead and wash us away too because we're no better? They didn't have to wonder that though because after God had so whipped them with the law, he also gave them such sure and certain comfort. The flood is filled with a pure gospel. The ark itself, this boat that God prepared for Noah and his family, which unbelievably kept them safe through all of these unbelievable upheavals. And then afterwards, the firm ground that they stepped out on 
which must have felt so good beneath their feet. That firm ground was almost as firm as the promise that he gave them. As long as the earth remains, never again. This is the covenant, God said, that I make with you and with your sons and with all of your descendants, and not only that, with every living creature that is on the earth. Do you see how many times he repeated it? I mentioned chapter 8, but then in our text, he says it in verse 11, twice. Then he attaches the sign of the rainbow and repeats that like three more times. Because he knows that after this terrible preaching of the law, their hearts need to be comforted by the repetition of his promises. He's saying, I will not forget. When you see those rains come and you start to worry that at last I'm going to bring my judgment once again, the rains will end. And in the ending of the rain, you will see this sign of my promise. In the mixing of rain and sun, you'll see that rainbow. And think what solid ground this gives you, too. When the world fears, when the waves rise and threaten, and the clouds gather, you can remember the rainbow. Remember the promise that God made. Yeah, there will be troubles. There will be death. There will be catastrophes. But never again anything quite like the flood. And you don't need to be afraid of them. Even the troubles that come into your own life. You don't need to fear. For you know that the Lord's promise is sure. It's solid ground. He's using all these things to keep you focused. To warn you about the true judgment that is coming. Because notice, when I quoted from chapter 8 earlier, God said, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest and summer and winter and day and night and cold and heat shall not cease, as long as the earth remains. But a day is coming when Christ the Lord will descend as judge. And the earth will no longer remain. For the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. As St. Peter reminds us, the heavens existed long ago. And the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire. Being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. That's the real thing. God wants you to keep your focus on it, be concerned about. He puts that rainbow in the cloud for everyone to see. He writes the evidence of the flood in a million ways throughout the world in order to rod and remind people of this coming judgment, but also he gives that rainbow to remind you of comfort and hope in Christ Jesus. For hidden in that rainbow is the very life of Christ. Now to be clear, that promise that we just read that God attached to the rainbow is not itself the promise of Christ who would destroy the devil, right? I mean, one way you could tell this is the simple fact that he made this promise for the animals. He said, this is my covenant between me and between all living flesh. And the promise of salvation in Christ, it's not really for the animals. I mean, it's for creation in like a secondary way. We read in Romans how creation is waiting for the revealing of the sons of God, this new creation, and coming into its glory in that way. But not in this sense. However, the promise of Christ saturates the promise that God makes of this rainbow. It is behind it and weaved into it in every way. Think of it kind of like this. What is a rainbow but pure light? I was talking with my kids about this. They said to me, there are, there's no white and no black in the rainbow. We said, oh, there's all the colors in the rainbow. They said, well, no, there's no white and there's no black. And they said, well, you're right about the black because black isn't even a color. It's just the absence of color. When you see something black, you're just seeing no color. White, they're also sort of right, except that the rainbow is really just white split up, right? Pure light just refracted in all, into all of its parts. And that's sort of what's going on with this promise of the rainbow. Christ is the light behind it. Christ is the light refracted in this promise for us to see. It is God's grace that shines here. See, the other day somebody said to me, why does God put up with it? He meant all of us. Why does God put up with all the sin? Before the flood, God saw the way that man had corrupted the earth. You know, in our text, it said God said that he would never again ruin the earth, destroy the earth. And that's the same word that God used before the flood when he looked at the earth and said, oh, it's already ruined. Man ruined it. I might as well destroy it. Same word. So God looks at the way that man has destroyed the earth, and he is so disgusted with the violence and the sin that it says he was sorry he had made man. What's changed? 
If God knew, and he did, it's not like he learned something. If God knew that sin would still fester in the human heart, and that from generation to generation it would fill the world again with the same violence and unbelief and sin as before, if he knew that he would one day destroy the whole world, why did he wait? Why put up with it? Why abide another three or four or five thousand years of sin? Why put up with your selfishness and hatred and laziness and lovelessness every time you sin? Why not strike you dead on the spot? Why put up with genocide and abortion and racism and rape and warfare? People ask this question all the time, don't they? They say, how could a good God allow all this suffering? How can he stand there and watch the world burn? And you know what they're really asking? They don't know they're asking this. But what they're really asking is, God, why did you just kill everyone? Because that's how he would get rid of the evil, since every intention of man's part is only evil all the time. But the answer, of course, is Jesus. The answer is grace. God waited. God postponed his wrath in order to send you salvation. Jesus is the way of escape. Jesus is the light of the world who came to the cross. There, in the darkness, beneath the thunderclap of the Father's wrath against your sin, he shed his blood. And the light of Easter morning shines, as it were, through that blood and is refracted into a thousand hues of grace, a rainbow of forgiveness for all the world. As in the flood, God washed the entire earth in judgment. As in the rainbow, God gives this promise for all people to see so in Christ. God has traced a cross over all the earth. And what he has done universally in Jesus Christ, he brings to you personally in your baptism. Peter tells us, that baptism is the antitype to the flood. That, that the flood pictures baptism. He says, baptism now saves you. It saves you from this wrath of God. It saves you from the death and evil of your own heart. Because in baptism, you are bound to Jesus Christ. You are brought into him who is himself, the ark who carries you through every trouble and disaster of this life and through the terrible judgment of the last day to the new heavens and new earth which he alone will create. Baptism binds you to Jesus, gives you his forgiveness, which is for every child of Noah. He said, for you and all of your descendants after you. He assures you of this. As the rainbow stretches from one end of heaven to the other, so Christ is for every man, woman, and child. See, Jesus is the new the. As the flood, the only thing of its kind, the only universal and complete destruction, so Jesus is the only universal Savior. He is the only and all-sufficient Redeemer. He is the Lamb of God and the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection and the way and the truth and the life and the Alpha and the Omega and the beginning and the end. He is the solid ground that you can stand on and the sun after rain to give you eternal hope. He is your salvation from the true apocalypse that is coming. So when you see the rainbow, remember, Remember the universal judgment of the flood. Remember the true danger that awaits. Remember what God has promised. And remember why. Remember that Christ is behind every single rainbow. And that when you look at that and remember, God himself remembers. Looking right back at you in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise, and we'll confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Print on page 6 of the bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll sing him 809.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great grace, that through faith in you, Noah found favor in your sight, and that because of your promise of a Savior, you preserved Noah and his family through the destruction of the flood, so that through his line, you might bring your Son, the Christ, into this world. And that we, through faith, might be bound to him and saved from the destruction that we deserve. Grant, Lord, that this preaching of the gospel might sound forth through all the world. That many hearts might hear and repent and believe. We ask for your blessing upon your gospel wherever it is preached and heard. Give boldness to our pastors and teachers and missionaries here and in other lands. Give joy and gladness to confess your name to all of us in our various vocations as parents as neighbors, as friends, to have the boldness to preach your name to those who need to hear it, to have your compassion to show your love to all around us so that they may see our good works. You prepare in us and glorify you, our Father in heaven. We ask, Lord, that you would bless those who are weak, who are sick, who are sad, who are lonely, who are doubting. Give them the confidence and joy of your presence. Give them faith in your name. Strengthen us all in that same thing. And we ask, Lord, for your blessing, especially upon those that we have been asked to remember who are sick or lonely or hurting in any way, especially for Don Bickham and Kaylee Yudi and for Carol Gilbertson and all those we remember before you. Give them the hope and comfort of your word and salvation through Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in your name, confident that you will hear us through Jesus Christ. In whose name we also pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. We'll conclude with our last hymn, hymn 919. <coughs>
to be with you here as always and share the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. Welcome also to our visitors. I am Rich and Kathy. I'm speaking Kathy, man. From the side of the um, You probably didn't know you were going to be seen like a, a drop fest today in church. <laughs> I haven't done that in months, but whatever. Thanks, Mary. Uh, so, some of you probably thought there was going to be a voters meeting today. Little did you know, there would not be. Uh, a few different things happened. So there's not going to be a voters meeting here. What was the date that we talked about? August 11th. August 11th. A Wednesday. So that draws into something else. Our Wednesday, our, Wednesday, our midweek situation is fluid at this point. We had been doing the midweek Wednesday service as a repetition of the Sunday service, partly in order to give like more opportunities so we could have greater like social distance, distancing available. No one's coming to Wednesday anymore. People have all slowly kind of migrated back to Sunday morning. And so we're gonna be using that differently. So sometimes we'll use it for church functions like voters meeting um, at some point. There may be a uh, Vesper service happening again, but it might be a different day. I'm trying to figure out how to use that to best serve people who maybe have hard time coming on Sunday morning. And that might not always be Wednesday night. So uh, as that happens, I'll announce it to you. So this week, Wednesday, uh, not sorry, sorry. This week, maybe, I don't know what's happening yet. Right? Next week, Wednesday, is a voter's meeting. Um, I'll send out an email about that. Uh, so today there is Bible study. There is not Sunday school. 